Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I am Bradshaw. That would be Mr. Briscoe, the Oklahoma legend. And when looks are important in wrestling, there was nobody in the history of the business who had a better look than the total package. A record for the U.S. championship as far as length held, consecutive days held, two-time WCW champion, world heavyweight champion, four horsemen. He has done it all, and he is our guest, and we're proud that he is. Mr. Lex Luger, thanks for joining our show. Wow, what a lead-in. Thank you, John. I'm honored to be on. I love Lex, watching I, your show, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you guys for a little bit here. Lex and Lex, we just want to have some laughs with you, but, uh, you know, I, I'm honored. I'm honored to be here because I'm honored to be with two of the longest reigning champions in my business, you know, Lex Luger and John Layfield. And, and what, what, what a privilege it is. But, you know, just, just, to, just to go back, we tried to do this interview last week, and there was an electrical storm where, you, where you're located in Atlanta, yeah. Georgia, and we had trouble with Wi-Fi. But we asked you a question. We wanted to get it rolling because we we're so th thrilled to have you on here. And we didn't want to miss the opportunity. You opened up the segment with uh, lady. Uh, you know, I asked you to t uh, share a little bit about your your beginning career. Everybody knows about your wrestling career, but your early career. I know you played at Penn State, then you went to uh, Miami, transferred to Miami. Uh, you, you were a high school basketball star, which I want to get into also because a lot of guys. But when you opened Put it up and say, yeah, I had a home visit from Joe Paterno, Joe Paul. John and I both were, wow, we, we got a serious guy here. You know, people don't <laughs> people don't understand the, the magnitude of getting a visit like that, you know, and oh, uh, it's wow, phenomenal. Man. Yeah, he showed up at my high school basketball game the night before the national signing day, which is kind of etched in stone back then in February. And man, everybody high school gym, they flipped out. And then <laughs> wow. he came back to our house and what a what a great memory. And I was actually getting ready to sign with the University of Miami the following day, and Joe flipped me. I ended up going to Penn State my freshman year. Really? That big, visit was once yeah. switched me over to go to Penn State. Yeah, the night before the signing date, I signed the next day with Penn State. Was it the visit that flipped you over? Or, Absolutely. Or, 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 Are you kidding me? Yeah. I thought he was recruiting me kind of like Penn State got a lot, so many top recruits back then. I thought Miami wanted me more. But when he came like the night before the national sign, they go, he must really like want me to come here. So yeah, that definitely flipped me. I so saw t tell us, show. tell us a little bit about that basketball career. And, and, uh, you know, you were a big guy. I mean, you were, you're what, six, four in high school, six, four, right. six, five, yeah. whatever it was. That's big in high school. I mean, you're, you're a man playing with, with boys basically at that time. Well, back in my day, um, I, I, I just love playing hoops. Um, I went to, back in the day, the, said the Nike Jesus camps, five-star basketball camp was the big camp in Honesdale, PA, and all the best players nationally. I went to that camp like oh, three years in a row. So I was a decent hoopster, but I stopped growing at 6'4", and I was like a power forward, and there aren't too many Charles, Bar Charles Barkley's out there. I think he was 6'5", but I realized that football, my, my physical makeup was probably better suited for football, though I love I loved playing hoops. I really did. did. Did you start playing football at an early age or did you, did it come along during basketball during high school? I didn't. I, I, uh, I played, started playing football my freshman year of high school just because my buddies played. I was mainly a basketball player. I almost didn't go out for football my senior year and my football coach talked me into it. I, I was at a speaking engagement uh, recently where they, my high school coaches, football coaches surprised me. And I told him, you spoke into my life. You said, I remember him telling me, if you put half the effort into football your senior year that you put in the basketball, I goes, I guarantee you'll get a full ride almost anywhere you want to go. I go, that changed my life. I ended up playing football, which led me into wrestling. I said, there wouldn't be a Lex Luger. that was coming here to listen, uh, to speak at this men's group tonight. If it wasn't for you guys, he got off, man, it was, it was a moment. He played football at Syracuse with Jim Brown. He's a rough, tough guy. He got all teared up, man. It was, it was, it was an awesome, awesome uh, moment for us. I did saw him for like forty years. I did saw your mom did Lex. They, he talked about Joe Pa, and that you didn't even get a picture with him because your parents were not huge college football fans, and they they really didn't know how big a deal he was. Oh man, you did your homework. Yeah, my dad, and mom were all all about music. I was a 
I was the only kid in my family that did sports. My dad didn't really understand it. And Joe Pass, hey, would you like a picture with me on the way out? My dad goes, no, that's okay. Like, was, <laughs> I could see Joe's face was like, what, what the heck? <laughs> it was probably the first time you ever got turned down for a photo op. So, yeah. so what was the transition then? To, to what, what happened at Penn State or what happened at University of Miami that caused you to switch down and go to University of Miami? The weather. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Two words, yeah. the weather. Happy Valley ain't so happy in the winter. Ooh, no, <laughs> it's not. Miles through there, walking to class a mile across campus. Uh-uh. I ran down the University of Miami to transfer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you I would have hit down there. You told us before we, we come on air that uh, you, you got to play against Ron Simmons in college. Oh, yeah. What a physical specimen. What a beast. Uh, I came up the line of scrimmage. We're playing an afternoon game in the Orange Bowl. It was my first home game in the Orange Bowl. And the guy next to me was playing right across from Ron. And his name was Tom Sedley. He benched about 275 pounds. Ron was standing there with his sleeves rolled up, the, the veins popping out of his bicep. Tom, he was, his eyes got as big as saucers. He was so scared. Oh my gosh, Ron Simmons must have had like 15 tackles that day. He was an absolute amazing college football game. We said Bobby Bowden with Deion Sanders and all those Hall of Famers out of there. He said Ron Simmons was the greatest college football player. He ever coached three time All American. Wow. Ron, was, Ron was the man. He was something wow. else. You, yeah. you mentioned you mentioned him bench pressing 275. Ron set the rookie record when he was with the Cleveland Browns. He did 225 48 times. He broke all those He was he was world class strength. Oh, freaky! I was in the gym one time in Pittsburgh, thinking I was pretty good. You know, I was doing like like uh, 405 for like you know eight reps or something. Ron came in and put 225 in the bar. Ron and I talked about this this past weekend. I was with Ron. We had a great time at an appearance we did together. And came in, warmed up at 225, went to 315, did a few reps, went to 405 with the four big big wheels on each side. Then he went to five big wheels each side, which was with the collars on, was 505, and did four or five reps, got up and walked out of the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I was so mad at him. I was like, did you just see that? My gosh. I mean, unbelievable, that guy. Lex, I traveled with him for years. He would do the same thing years later. And, and he would show up in his cowboy boots and jeans in the gym, do a little bench press. And, you know, at that time, he'd play with 225, sometimes 315. He didn't go that heavy, you know, as he got older. But he would still – he right. just played with it like it was full of helium. And he'd be in jeans and boots. And then he'd walk out of the gym. And I'm in there sweating. I'm thinking, I'm working this hard to look this bad. And that man does yeah. nothing. <laughs> it looks like a – Yeah, I, I would – I always worked out like two hours in the gym. Ron comes in and worked out on the bench for like, he looked incredible and walked out about 20 minutes later after repping 505. I'm like, this is insane. Unbelievable. Wow. wow. Legendary. Yeah. Uh, Lex, Lex, when did the, when did the bodybuilding and, and the weightlifting come into picture for you? At what I, age? I actually had the opportunity to work with the world's strongest man. He won the world's strongest man contest in high school outside of Buffalo, New York, where I was born and raised, Don wow. Reinhout, and he was a world-class powerlifter, had the total world record. He squatted like 900-something, bench 600-something, uh, had the world record of deadlift at the time, 885. I mean, he took Craig Wolfley and I and Jim Bird, all three of us ended up playing, playing pro football. We were all on the same high school team. And Craig Wolfley played for Steelers for 13 years. Jim Bird won a Super Bowl with the Giants. And, and the 49ers, all three of us played high school together and we worked out with Don Ryder. He laid that, talk about mentorship now. We, John and I were talking about earlier, I wanted to get this in while we're talking about this. I told John how he mentors all those young boys through, through rugby and what he's doing outside of the ring. And I know, I know Jerry, what a difference. Uh, you are so beloved by so many of us in the business for your 30 plus years, you had, you and John had all these great in-ring accomplishments, but you guys have meant so much more outside of the ring. And the, and the young people and wrestlers you've mentored and made a difference in, Jerry, and you, John, as well. I, I just have so much respect for you guys. I really do. Well, but thank Don's you, Lex. 
Thanks. Next, I believe that's you know what what we're all about in this sport. I mean, we we all we all you know, we all fall for what we got. We we're all athletes, and we we work twenty four seven at, at at college athletes, at high school athletes, and even in middle school. And then when we got to pro, that hard work was just something that was in ingrained in our in our soul, and and and. and and you just want to pass along. You just want to pass a little, little details along. I mean, anybody can pass a headlock along or a wrist lock or something like that. But if you can pass something along in life, like John is doing and like you're doing now, wow, that's a gift that, you know, that we were, we were put here to do. And uh, so well, thank hey, you man, for bringing it What up. an opportunity for us, right? Yes. It's really, really, yeah, it's great. But I wanted to let you guys know how much I have my respect all that you guys have done and are doing it's, it's special i appreciate well, you guys you. a lot i've so enjoyed i've been inspired by watching your interviews getting ready for this one uh, of all the stuff you're doing and the difference you're making in life it's really it's really an inspirational story and when you start watching them you think i'm not doing enough <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> you know i, you know, I, I mean that oh. very much it's it's such a great thing to be able to to because when your name becomes so big it's good you do something with it that's positive absolutely you, you I didn't realize you played with Jim Burt in, in high school. You play, I know you played with Jim Kelly down at, you know, but you played with Jim Burt at college too, didn't you? I did. Yeah. He came to Miami. We both went to uh, Miami together. Yeah, he had that famous time. play where he launched uh, Joe Montana, where he came in there and almost killed him. You know, he was a big, strong man at Jim Burt. Oh, Burt. yeah. Yeah. He was a what a high man. school. What a high school football team you must have had. Were you guys we did. champions? We were, well, we were undefeated our senior year. For, wow. uh, and we had a great team. But Don Reinhardt, getting back to him, he uh, was the biggest human being I'd ever, I'd ever seen. He was 6'4", 365 pounds. He had traps, like they made Goldberg's traps look like minuscule, like two softballs on top of each, off the side of his neck, uh, or Brock Lesnar. He, I mean, I never saw a human being like that in all my life. And we were just awestruck. He took us in to his gym in his basement. He taught us how to, you know, work and, 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 how to, how to build a foundation of, of strength uh, through basic exercises, you know, cleans and deadlifts and bench presses. And that really catapulted us in our football career, for sure. Lex, how did the progression make? I know you had uh, an, an incident in Georgia with uh, you were mad because you weren't starting, I think it was, and had, you left the team after in University of Miami. But then you went straight pro. How did that happen? Because that's very unusual. Back then, you had to go four years of college. You know, Bosworth kind of got around it initially back in the 80s because he had graduated college and got to leave early. How did it work out for you to get a, end up going to Montreal Alouettes uh, early after only two years of college? This is crazy, but I was actually, if you can believe it, got kicked out of the University of Miami. How do you do that? For all this never happened to any athlete. I mean, <laughs> I mean, how do you do that? I got kicked off the team and I was bouncing at all the big clubs in Lauderdale at the time. When I mean, it was the late 70s and the disco craze was in. I worked at Pete Lenny's. The, there was a line every night around two blocks to get in that building. And I was the front door guy. And they, I used to make, I mean, huge tip money so people didn't have to wait in line. So I'm like, well, I was, maybe I was supposed to play football. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm kind of digging this. But there was a scout, um, a guy at Miami who was a scout in the CFL who talked to Montreal and once again a mentor. The guy who worked the front door of Pete Lenny's in Lauderdale, his name was Crush. He was a, a, a retired pro boxer. His nose was all caved in. His ears were all cauliflowered. And he took me aside and said, look, this nightlife in Lauderdale, I know, you, I know you're loving this right now as a young guy. Because he heard I had an offer to maybe go up to Canyon Football League and get a tryout. He goes, I, he goes I'm telling you, you can always come back to this. Because if I was you, he goes, I'd work hard, take that offer up there in Canada and go for it. Because Canada, like you said, John, did not have the age restrictions. So I went up there. I was still 19 years old. And it, I, I was, I guess, the youngest American that ever made a team up there. I and talk about timing, like, just like how I got in wrestling. Uh, the guy who was all pro up in Canada, who was an American, you know, had so many Americans per team, did a contract holdout. The coach took a liking to me. I ended up sliding right into his spot, and they ended up trading him uh, to, uh, 
so I, I mean, I walked right in and, and got a spot on the team. I was, it was incredible. Was that where so, you got to play in the Grey Cup? Because I read online, which my if it's, if it's here, online, yeah. it must be true. I played yeah. against Warren Moon in the Grey Cup. They beat us. Really? That was a thrill. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Moon, if you you know if you could count all the records he had in Canada, he, he had more passing yards than any human being ever walked on the planet. Crazy, crazy. What an good. accurate guy too. Uh, and that much of yeah, oh. yeah. Then then from there after the Grey Cup, you, you did you not want to stay in Canada, or is that when the USFL started back up? Well, we had I always had NFL aspirations, but I wasn't of age yet. Um, I was able. My contract was up in Montreal. I signed with Green Bay uh, Packers, and uh, I spent a year down the injured reserve. And then um, the bandit ball down in Tampa with Coach Spurrier, the ball coach. And I ended up getting the opportunity to play there uh, with the bandits. And ended up with the Memphis Showboats with Pepper Rogers. Talk about fun coaches in the USFL. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Steve so Spurrier and Pepper Rogers. Yeah, you had Steve uh, Steve Spurrier and Pepper Rogers. They're they're, they're known as two of the most uh, greatest coaches and, and fun coaches, player coaches to be around. Oh, Pepper when it was real hot out in Memphis in the early summer. He'd have to start uh, opening practice and get us about a half hour in. We worked up a good sweat, and he'd go. He'd call a team together. Go, man, it's hot out here, ain't it, boys? We go. Pepper we like, well, yeah, you know, hell yeah, and uh, and he go. Well, guess what? We got beer and barbecue and cold <laughs> beverages over there. Let's, let's just take it in. The guys all look at you like, are you kidding me? He, I mean, he would he would do stuff like that. that no, no football coaches do that. So, but boy, you wanted to play for him on game day. Man, I'm telling you, he was he was a great coach. He was a lot of fun. When I was not, only, not, only, not only did you have uh, Steve Spurrier here here in Tampa for the Tampa Bay Bandits, you guys own the – I was telling John earlier that, you know, the, the impact that the Bandits had here, the Buccaneers, you know, whether the old Buccaneers, they sucked, you know, and I was, a, they I did. was one of those – They weren't that good, poor, Jerry. Yeah, I was one of those poor <laughs> fans that sat through the 0-126, so I know how bad they sucked. And sat out there in that heat and everything – then the John, the band, Tampa Bay Bandits come along. Not only was Steve Spurrier his coach, but they brought in Burt Reynolds as an owner. And, of course, Burt brought Lonnie Anderson in as, as one of the owners. And uh, there were several several other guys. You probably remember a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Jim McVeigh, uh, Alex. That, that was there. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, he runs the Outback Bowl here now, and he's still a good friend of mine, and I see him all the time. And. But the bandit ball, you guys were averaging 40,000 people while the Buccaneers were averaging around 15,000. You guys basically <laughs> well, owned we were out city. the NFL team. That was a blast. The, the stadium was electric. Spurrier, Spurrier was already wide open, which back then was unusual with the passing attack. They called it bandit ball. It was, we had so much fun. Great memory, great memories of that, for sure. If the USFL hadn't gotten a lawsuit with the NFL and then end up winning, but really not winning, uh, it folded the league. Would you have stayed in the USFL? You know, I might have. There was such a glut of guys trying to get back to the NFL. And I, of course, walked into uh, championship wrestling in Florida and met Mirhiro Matsuda. And the rest is history as far as my rest going to wrestling. But yeah, I might, I might have ended up never wrestling and, being, and staying in football, for sure. And so many great players came out of that league. People were going way back, but my gosh. Some NFL all-time greats came out of that USFL. It was quite a league. I had you, were Hersh against, you were uh, Herschel Howie. Walker. You were Herschel Walker league at the right time, too, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. did, 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 how was it planned? Did, I, I'm sure you guys played with, with the New York Titans. Or they whatever were the they New Jersey were. Generals. Donald Trump. Jersey on the team. General. Yeah, Donald Trump yeah. on the team. Did yeah. uh, uh, I'm sure you ran it head-to-head -head with uh, Herschel then. Oh, he was something else, man. Wow. Unstoppable. Lex, I saw that uh, when I was at the LA for a cup of coffee, I had to go against Howie Long every day. But fortunately, oh my God, Howie Long, Howie Long was not a practice player. <laughs> he didn't look at it. That's good. That's a good thing. Which yeah. is a good thing for me because all yeah. Howie wanted to do is get a look, get a, one look and one step, and don't try to make the team off of him, and it's going to be an easy day. You had Reggie White at Memphis, and you said oh he was God. not the lazy <laughs> practice player. He was not. <laughs> he would talk about a force of nature. 
we talked about Ron, Reggie White was, I mean, he, he was like, if you try to run block him, it was like running into a, I mean, talk about getting stoned, like running into a brick wall, unbelievable. When we'd have, back then, the, the old days, we used to have that Oklahoma drill where you're both on your back, oh. and you're running backs behind you, and we both line up across from each other. It's a run drill. Man, no one wanted to get in line against Reggie. Everybody, <laughs> everybody starts shifting so they wouldn't get in line and go against Reggie. He was unbelievable. The, the wow. dumbest drill ever. And, of course, it's named after Jerry's home state. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There you well, go. Well, you had Jerry. to be men to do that drill, I'll tell you. you had to be, you had to be <laughs> I hated that drill. He just lined up and just got concussions. And just hit what? each other. I mean, that's what we do. That's all there. you did. You, you lined stand up. in a circle and stand in a circle, call numbers out, run into each other. What else is there to do out there, John? <laughs> well, I saw a video recently on Twitter, I think it was, and they showed two kids doing the Oklahoma drill. And all these comments from our new woke culture was, Who's allowing this to happen and all that stuff? I'm like, man, we should do that in preseason, like like every day in practice. That's right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Water like, breaks or what? No water breaks. Yeah. When it's you were beer, Bay, beer barbecue you, breaks, but no water breaks. Yeah. They had beer, they had beer breaks, but they didn't have water breaks. <laughs> well, pepper was not the norm for for coaches even back then, for sure. Lex, when you were with Green Bay, were you injured or just on injured reserve? Because that's how they kept the guys a lot. To, you know, you. I did get injured in preseason, and and so it was it was a legit injury at the time. Yeah, because they 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 did they did that a lot to keep keep players. Right. So I didn't know if when you're on injured reserve, no one ever knew. You know, because that's how teams kept guys. Yeah. Yeah. I actually got injured uh, two weeks out from the final cutdown. That they liked me enough that they they definitely wanted to, to keep me on the team. So. But uh, yeah, I had a leg- I actually had a legit injury for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd seen online that you had uh, you met Bob Roop at a celebrity golf tournament. Was that how you got connected to Hero? That Bob is, Roop? I love I love Wikipedia because so much on there is true, but they mix in total fables. But I never <laughs> met Bob Roop at a golf tournament. Bob, well, you know why? I got I got to jump in. There. I got to jump in there. When I when I saw that, I said, well, I know Bob Roop never went to a golf tournament. I've known Bob Roop <laughs> since nineteen sixty four, I mean, and I never. Bob might have hung out in the beer cart, but Bob wasn't yeah. playing any golf. No. <laughs> You're telling me something on the internet's wrong. <laughs> something on the yeah, on Wikipedia. Can you believe it? That is, wow. I don't know who put that in there for a rib or something. Because it's like all these truths, but people slide in like, like stuff that never happened. That like I think it's kind of a rib. But I, I read that. I go, what are they talking about? Bob Roop in a golf tournament? I go, my gosh, that's a total <laughs> falsehood. I'm glad we brought that up. We cleared that up once and for so, all. So how did you get the honor of meeting uh, Mr. Matsuda? I I was in the off season of football. I walked into the championship wrestling of Florida office, which you're familiar with, with that old building down there down in Tampa and bumped and, and Danny Miller was like the, like this, the bouncer at the front desk. Right. And I talked to him. He took a look at me, you know, I, I was loved work, working the weights and stuff. He looked at me, goes, I think he sent me to figure here, hero Matsuda to run me off. But I, he sent me over to the factory. Matsuda trained guys in that sweat box. He had over, a, over a on Lois Avenue, over on Lois Avenue, right up yeah. from the body shop there. He would turn the air conditioning off. It'd be 130 yeah. degrees in there and take you through Hindu squats and push-ups. You do it all with you now. But I figured Danny probably figured out a hero run this football player off. Be hero and I hit it off. And I never went back to football. I know John was asking me, do I think I'd still be playing football? I was still gonna have a football career, but hero and I hit it off so incredible. He actually managed me on my first few matches, came to me at, at the shows and we hit it off, a special friendship. I'll never forget. Talk about people who pour into other people's lives and mentor people. And Matsuda got my career started. And it was like the 4th of July fireworks. I had a match with Wahoo McDaniels, one of the greatest ever, three weeks into my career for the Southern Heavyweight title. Wow. I mean, it was crazy. Wahoo asked him, what am I supposed to do with this guy? He doesn't know <laughs> anything. And Matsuda did the old line. Well, Wahoo, if you if you so good, you can have match with broomstick <laughs> so that sounds like mad suda <laughs> mm-hmm. and then wahoo wasn't gonna talk back he talked back to a lot of people but wahoo wasn't gonna talk back to hero mad suda no people took hero seriously he had mailed out a little bit 
by the time yeah. he didn't yeah. break my leg like he did Hogan's and stuff, but yeah. thankfully. But he has Matsuda was a serious kind of guy now. Yeah. John, John, the, the facility, like I said, it was over in Drew Park on Lois Avenue. And it's a, it's a, it's right there by Tampa Stadium and the baseball parks, but it, it's stuck off in the corner. The body shop is like two blocks from over there. And Matsuda ran, ran it like it was a damn sweat factory there. He actually, what he made, he made, he made international singlet for the international wrestling teams in Japan and the United States. Mm -hmm. And he made, he had sewing machines in there and he had women sewing in there and he'd turn off all the air conditioning because he wrote, didn't, didn't, you know, Japanese, he didn't like air conditioning and the women did. They figured they'd work faster. But he'd also have the wrestlers there. He had some weights in there, and and, and the floors covered with mats. And uh, he he had guys screaming all over that Drew Park area there. And uh, oh, well, well, what an experience that had to be. He'd have us meet him there, like you think it'd be early morning when it's cooler down in Florida in the summer. Uh uh. He has to meet him there like four in the afternoon. He'd take us out for a five mile run as a warm up. Yeah, he had that he run around the park there, that run around those old yeah. Yeah, like five blocks. And my goal actually, and I, I went over there, I, I don't know what got into me, but one time I, I just, you know what, I, I want to see what all this is about. I'd heard all of this about, so, about Mad City Training Guys. So I, I, when you start in your next camp, so I went over. And so I, I the camp was, uh, at that time, he was doing like three week, he was doing a three week camp. So I said, I'm going to make it. And, and I, I ran that, uh, that course at and he beat me to like I was, uh, like I was crawling. He was, he was a uh, Usain Bolt. So my goal at that time was I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stay in this camp until I can outrun Matsuda in this run. I don't care about the wrestling part of it. I don't care about the lifting. I just want to beat him in this, in this five mile run. So about, about a week and a half in, I was feeling good, man. I'd, I'd been training. I beat Mad Suit. I put my gear on. I walked. He said, Where are you going when I'm finished yet? I said, I'm finished. I never walked back in that damn place again. <laughs> 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 Mad Suit was very competitive. My gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We do like push ups, like 50 reps each. Like, and as soon as you get, he was done, you'd go. And on those little platforms. And man, we got each other. We, we, when, when the one guy was finished, we'd be pushing each other off. The, 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 he'd be born to push me off to do his set right away. He was competitive, man. I'm telling you, he was something else. What a great man. I, so I, you, I were, you, were, you were actually in the ring within uh, a few months of the time you started training, uh, having title match. I mean, you, you, you were, you know, I told John earlier too, if a name ever, or if a moniker ever stuck with a guy and fit a guy, that total package fits you, right? Even right from the very beginning, like you, you had you, you had all the looks and, and every, all the talent necessary there. So the, the, you, 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 they pushed you right to the top and, uh, and you were wrestling for titles. I mean, almost immediately out of the gate. Yeah. I won the, the Southern heavyweight title. I think like two months in against Jesse Barr and then Flair came down and wrestled me in an hour Broadway. And <laughs> what was that life changing? Rick Flair was Daytona beach ocean front center there in Daytona. And Rick showed up with the limo and the, you know, the custom suits, the diamond rings and jewelry, the Rolex. And I, man, I was like, man, I want to be like him. Yeah. And Rick, got, I don't know how he got me through an hour of Broadway. He called a sunset flip. I'd never done one. Didn't even know what it was. Rick, <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick called a sunset flip. You know, I, I go, what's that? Rick was, oh my God. <laughs> I love it. I love but it. somehow Rick carried me like only Rick could do, right? Nate, through an hour of Broadway down in Daytona Beach, he went back and Rick talked me up to the Crockett's and NWA. And, and a few months later, I, I was in there with the horsemen, if you can believe it. And you weren't even in the business a year when you went that hour Broadway with Rick, right? Oh, yeah. I was probably in six months. Huh. Wow. Yeah. And Rick went up and talked me up to the Crockett's and at, le at less than the one year mark, I was in there with the whole four horsemen replacing Oli. I mean, can you believe that? Wow. Amazing. Yeah. yeah thank, thankfully, Oli wanted to watch his kid wrestle. And wasn't that what it was that Oli did? Oh, did, yeah. That was a shoot. But yeah, we squeezed him right out, man. He <laughs> left him in a blue closet the rest of history. How did you like working with Crockett? Oh, it was great. We had a great group down there. Uh, I was with Aaron and Tully and Nate and JJ. And when we had, we had just 
so much fun traveling together and hanging out together. We Croc had the private jet. Oh my gosh, we were it, it was it was uh, an amazing transition coming from football in, into that environment. When and I remember uh, uh, Dusty, who was book, the book at the time, said, hey, Lexi's a really straight guy. He's coming from football, happily married. Nate, don't, leave him alone. Don't mess with him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that didn't last long. I jumped right in and got, got right with it. But because, uh, and, and Rick, I always, told, I always tell Rick, Rick, you ruined me because Rick, everything I did, Rick was mentoring me. Like he told me I had to buy a Rolex. So I went and bought a Rolex. I wasn't making Ric Flair money right away. And then he said, he sent me, you got to go buy a Mercedes. So I went and I bought like a top of the line Mercedes. And, and I, then I go to Rick, I go, Rick, where do you tint your windows uh, for the Mercedes around here in Charlotte? We were living in Charlotte. Time. And Rick goes, don't you dare tint those windows. I go, well, why not? The, it's hot here in the summer. He goes, if you're going to buy a top of the line Mercedes, Rick says, you want everybody to see who's, who's driving that car. He goes, don't you dare tint those windows. Because it's all about image enhancement, baby. So <laughs> Nate was, I say, Nate, man, you ruined me with all that image enhancement stuff. But I really modeled my early career. I wanted to be just like Nate. He got me up. One of those robes that, that the girl made for him cost $5,000, which was a lot of money for me at the time with the rhinestones and with Lex Luger on it. I, I really patterned my, myself up. There's only one day, but I, he was like, man, I, I was really trying to be like, be another, like another nature boy. When you had that the, was a lot of fun. When, when they had the U.S. title on you for so long, you know, it, it's really unusual in, in wrestling. You know, uh, Steamboat and Savage, you know, really – raised the Intercontinental Championship uh, and right. several guys have done it since. Uh, Brett and Davey had a final their Intercontinental Championship, you know, really raised, but it's hard to raise a title that's not the World Heavyweight Championship. You did it in WCW. Did you know at the time you're thinking, I I'm really raising the status of this or was it just a matter of you just wanted, we were going from one week to the next as far as storylines and angles because you had so many great people to work with. You know, I ended up in my career having world titles and tag team, world tag team titles and television, world television titles. But when I go to signing stuff, people think of me as like the U.S. champion. And really, Magnum and Nikita Koloff, Magnum TA, they kind of laid the groundwork with that U.S. title. And that title meant a lot back then. And yeah. um, I didn't really realize time how much history that U.S. title had in the NWA. And that kind of, to this day now, when I do signings, like I said, I was with Ron Simmons this weekend. We had a blast doing some, you know, mixing with fan interactive events and autographs and pictures. People, like when they pick out photos for me to sign, if they like that U.S. title and we got like a U.S. title belt, a, a, a real leopard club, people love that. that. That's really my favorite title I ever had uh, was the U.S. title. That really got my career, like a foundation of my career Going to that meant so much to me. I, I love that. Plus, it's a really nice looking belt. So, <laughs> right. huh. yeah, I, I that U.S. title was definitely. Uh, I think I still am. Not, I'm not bragging, but I think I still am the longest like overall reign of nine or something days or something. Nowadays, with you know, as we know, guys, pay per view, pay per view, and titles get switched so much now. Yeah, that, that that's a long time to have a belt. I mean, yeah, I think I think I had the U.S. title for about thirty days, so you're only like nine hundred and eighteen days ahead. Of you. <laughs> well, everything's on the everything's on the thirty day clock now, right? It takes <laughs> a month, right? <laughs> that's that's right. The after that run, and then, then Flair decides to go to uh, uh, WWE, and he took right. the title with him. And that's when you and Wyndham had the, the great match. Did you have any trepidation about stepping in? And, uh, you know, you mentioned how much you liked Flair. And, I, you know, it's just business. I understand it's nothing personal, but Absolutely. you're having to come in and make that replacement, which is one of the hardest things to do in a territory. You know, when a territory is hot, everybody wants to be on top. But when there's some type of transition, people aren't raising their hand very, very quick to be on top. You had to be the guy. Well, they kind of, I don't know if they kind of chose me to switch heel and they put, I mean, they surrounded with greatness. Harley race and a bodyguard. We tried to do all the bells and whistles. When I won the match the cage, we didn't even have a title uh, belt made yet. So don't hold the belt up. So it's not a real, like a real title belt. And we, uh, but they, I mean, they really tried out, but I mean, come on, anybody to step in the shoes of, of Ric Flair 
who's, who was known as the champion and, and, and WCW and then the NWA before that. There's, there's no, I mean, I did the best I could, but that, that was a, that was a very difficult assignment for sure. Yeah, you did, you did a great job with it, but what a screw up it was to let Flair leave as champion with the title. Yeah, that was crazy. Do you have any? Do you have any up. idea how they let that happen, Lex? Would, would, were you privy to any of that information? What? What? I mean, I, I can't imagine they just uh, just letting them leave like that. Yeah, I think there was just a lot of stuff going on with Barnett and uh, Rick and Dusty and Crockett, and I didn't know any of the details. To be honest with you, uh, I was more of a foot soldier still at that point in my career. Right. Uh, just, but uh, I knew there was a lot, a lot of stuff going on, but no one envisioned that Rick, because I guess that belt was actually a shoot, like NWA, and there was like a $10,000 deposit on her. I don't know what it was, but it, yeah, that was like crazy how they let him go to WWE after the time, WD with that belt. That, that was, like you said, a colossal error on their part. Yeah, and here's no it led it led a lot to the Montreal screw job with Bret Hart. I mean, Jerry, you might can address this more because you you're the one you're the one giving Sean a quick tutorial on how to get out of the ring the, the night before. But you know, the, the main thought was we don't want Bret to show up on WCW television with that title like Flair did earlier. And that had a big impact, right, Jerry, on the mindset of WWE with the Montreal screw job. Well, that was the exact mindset going into there. They did that. We didn't want the exact same thing to happen again. And, uh, events, events, events and pride, you know, you, you, I've listened to, I don't know how many ever I listened to people that wasn't even there and listened to people that wasn't even in the business at the time, you know, tell a story on exactly what happened there. But, uh, we would, you know, we'd been burnt with the Medusa would, you know, and we knew that, uh, what Flair had done, of course, and uh, we didn't want the same thing happening, and uh, and it, it was over with, and uh, and and you know, it's it's rehashing the story, but Brett didn't want to do the, the time honored tradition in the business. So, my meeting with with Sean that night it was, was more of a meeting of of helping Sean survive something because you're not going to teach a guy to be mean overnight. And Shawn Michaels, as we all know, is not a big guy. He's a nice guy, and he he's had to help beat out of him several times. So he's not a fighter. So I okay, I went up and I okay, what do you know? And okay, here here's what you can do if you get you know, but you got to be the aggressor. You can't wait, you know. So it was it was more it was more me helping Shawn survive if anything seriously happened to him that night. Wow. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it was all based on, you know, what had happened with Ric Flair and that title. You know, we didn't want it to happen to us. Lex, right after that, you had the, you had the title for quite a while, but in, I guess in 91, uh, you, you had reached your dates for your contract. You, you know, I didn't realize your dates. When I, when I heard you say in the interview it was 275 dates a year. That, that is God, I, I always ran out uh, first, first two weeks in November. So they would usually wow. uh, sign me to a, an additional amount between uh, early November and the end of the year. But Jim Hurd was in charge at the time, the infamous Jim Hurd. And he said, all oh, that money, we're paying him and we're supposed to pay him extra to, to work out the rest of the year, the hell with him. And so that kind of ticked me off. But here I, instead of congratulating me for surviving 275 matches and trying to fill in temporarily for Ric Flair, he didn't want to uh, give me a bump, an extra pay, pay for wrestling uh, above my 275 dates. And I, I just picked up the phone and uh, called Vince. And uh, so I, I'd met Vince in the past. He said, well, maybe love to do business someday. You know, I, I was a, a prototype type guy, looks wise for Vince, right? Yeah. And um, um, I called Vince, he said, well, because you got a year left your contract. I can't mess with you on that because uh, it was guaranteed contract WCW. But we discussed the possibility of you not wrestling and telling you just want a year off and doing the bodybuilding thing. So we worked the bodybuilding gimmick for you, which I love because I love working out at the gym. I think, wow, a year off with pay. It wasn't like a big amount of money, but Vince was going to pay me to train for a year as a bodybuilder, then I debut, 
the following year, which I did with Bobby Heenan at Royal Rumble, but do the bodybuilding for you. So I just went in the office of WCW, told Jim Hurd that um, I wanted to uh, take a year off, but I was burned out from so many dates because he, you know, could, he jammed me up. He wasn't going to pay me any extra. Made a bunch of money on the way out. They, they had wanted me to do a date in Japan. They paid me like 50 grand, which was huge money back then to do a match in Japan. And I got a year off to, train, uh, to weight train with Vince for the bodybuilding night. I had, a, I had a motorcycle wreck in the meantime, but still, it was a it was a year off to stay home and train, and work out, which I'd never been able to do. That was that was pretty sweet. Do you still have a supply of Ico Pro? <laughs> 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 I get asked that all the time. I know I don't, but uh, I, I got you. Got to admit, Vince is not afraid, right, to try no. new stuff. I mean, he he went all in in that bodybuilding thing. It didn't work out. He went all in and trying to get the next big, you know, supplement line out there uh, with the Ico Pro. He's not afraid. He you know, I, I, I had a, I had a I had a jar uh, a, a can of that Ico Pro in in my pantry that must have sat there for fifteen years. I don't know how many years, but about three years, about, about three or four years ago, my wife and I did some remodeling our house. We did our kitchen, and so. Of course, she's going through there, you know, all this supplement. She's looking at the dates on there. If this, throw this way, throw this way. I had two things in, in there in the, my pantry that I was saving. I had a 1973 bottle of, uh, of Jim Beam that Paul Bosch gave me for Christmas. I was working with Harley yeah. on a show down there, and Paul Bosch had it, and he actually signed it to do a Merry Christmas, Paul Bosch, 1973. I had that, and I had my container of Ico Pro, and I just wanted to keep. I never took Ico Pro, as you can tell. <laughs> if I would, I'd been Lex Luger. Watch out, man! So yeah, there you go. If I'd had a body, man, I'd been dangerous. But if I had any talent, I'd have been any more dangerous. But anyway, my wife <laughs> disposed of my Ico Pro, and I think she drank my bottle of Jim Beam. She said she tossed it, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Too valued, I prize possess. If I had those down, I could put them on eBay. I bet you that can of Ico Pro would draw me enough money where I wouldn't have to do this podcast with JBL. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Classic stuff. You know what's cool, Lex, is uh, Vince not only has the cojones to, to try stuff, he has the cojones to, to pull the plug, too. You know, he does, so many man. Guys, so many guys, they try stuff, but then, then they have, their ego is so big, they stay with it. If Vince sees it's not working, he, he just pulls the plug and Day one, let's start over. Do some, do something different. He does. He is a bold entrepreneur. You're right. He's got great a great feel for it. Absolutely. What happened with the WBF, the World Bodybuilding Federation? I mean, you got Gary Stride on the, the champion. I think they signed Lou Ferrigno, but he never competed. But was it really that <clears throat> bodybuilding was tough to transition, or was it just the fact that there's only one Arnold well, and I, you can't well, replicate Arnold? What was what was in my opinion was the main reason. Is it, it that it didn't get over well, WBF? Right. Well, number one, we all know Joe Reeder uh, always had a stranglehold on bodybuilding. Uh, but uh, if I had to use one word, wait a second, this might be two words. Um, my mom's a real wordsmith. Uh, I'd say the reason it didn't, it didn't succeed back in that time was drug testing. And this was going through the trial, and the drug testing was totally legit. And Back in that day, bodybuilding without drug testing didn't look the same. And the guys didn't and, look the same, and it bombed. And when you had the Olympia, of the Olympia, that they weren't drug testing, you had these <clears throat> freaks, you know, these guys that were right. unbelievable. It's just tough to compete with that. Yeah. So the drug testing uh, really, really killed that, to be, to be honest with you, at, the, at that time. Right. Now, we're all glad there's drug testing now, and it's healthier for all the guys and the athletes, but at that time, it, all the bodybuilders were loaded up on stuff, and that, that really basically killed it. And just from my my viewpoint, yeah. You when you when you heard, first heard about the Lex Express after that, uh, what what did you think? Well, I want to get I really want to get Jerry's insight of this because I had a I have a funny story to share. And they're doing this icons, which they do a great job of wrestling. They're doing a one on me, which was. Awesome. They've been working on that for six months. They're gonna, I guess we're going to be releasing it pretty soon. But when I went to the office, Vince, I was the narcissist. I mean, you know, looking in mirrors and 
all that. He called, you know, about Vince is, he, call, he called me to his office, which I'm like, Vince wants me to like to come to his office. And like, we were on the road. And I'm like, okay, he's fine being special in his office. He laid it out that I was going to get on a bus all summer uh, and slam Yokozuna and the, and the and trip. But I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking the whole time, yeah, but I'm the narcissist. How, how does that work? And I go, you think that'll work? Mince was, I promise you it'll work. Which actually the intrepid thing got over a bit. That was a well done yeah. event. But um, yeah. the, um, I was listening. So I was, I was seeing a, a trailer for the icons and they have coming out soon on me. And they showed Brett and Jerry, you were in, the, in it as well. Like, you know, they asked everybody for insights and they, I had the volume off. I'm trying to get the volume on my phone for the, the trailer. And, I, and they, they show little excerpts of the guys talking and Brett goes, man, that, I'm thinking they're doing this nice thing on me and Alex Express. And they have Brett talking about the Alex Express. And Brett Hart goes, well, I love Brett. And I get along great. I laugh with it. But Brett, when I see him, goes, man, that Alex Express was a curse for Lex. I'm like, well, that wasn't very nice. And then, then and Jerry, you got you to tell me with your Oklahoma twang. And that Jerry gets on and goes, that Les Express was a total flop. <laughs> goes, Jerry, Jerry, you got, Jerry, give me give me what you said on the icons video. That that I it love was the way you flop. said that. I, I can't Jerry. remember exactly what I said. I, 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 I but, but you you the old boy, where I got my I information so from hard. Lex. Lex, I got to tell you the truth where I got my uh, information from, I got it from a bad source. And I'll, I'm first to admit, when you get a bad source, you got a bad source. That damn brother love Bruce Pritchard told me. <laughs> that oh was my, my source. But when I saw the icons, like the little one minute thing, I think they're going to say all this nice stuff about me. I laughed so hard. I, I, I you know, about when Brett and you said, I go, well, I guess it's going to be kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Is I go, it's not just going to be a little. The icons, it boys a shoot, kind of like you know, they're, they're gonna they're gonna really go with this, you know. I was laughing Jerry, so hard, Jerry. What's up with it, Jerry? What's up with that? I'm a stooge. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, but I blame yeah. I blame the economy at the time, Jerry. I the lines were big at all the autograph signings. Some were saying the buy rate wasn't up much. We had a really bad economy at the time. That's why it didn't work. Get over too often. But you know, well, a lot I, of people... I, I, I blame Bruce Pritchard for it, Lex. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't blame you. You were the you were the total package. You had everything. You had everything except Bruce Pritchard was with you. <laughs> I think it was Bruce. Well, Pritchard's yeah, but fault. I I thought I was going to do like the Lex Express, like Yankee Doodle Dandy. Then go then go back to being like Lex with the total package. That's not what Vince had in mind. That's you, not you what he had in mind. No, he had that no. baby face all the way. I, I can't get this imagine you. And you, you and, you were you were traveling all day on this damn bus, and you know they they were shooting guys in and out on you all the time. But you were you were the you were the the clog there that stayed there the whole time, and uh, they were expecting you to be fresh every day. And I can understand. I mean, we all been on the road. We all had. To, and you were basically working twenty four seven at that time. Yeah, and, they and, not, and not and they're not a great environment. That was exhilarating and exhausting at the same time. They'd get up at four in the morning start the morning radio and TV shows. I would do two to three autograph signings for two to three hours at shopping malls. I do the nighttime weather guy stuff at the nighttime news. Then I get back to hotel like at eight, nine o'clock at night. And then I, of course I'm so driven that I go to the gym to like midnight and then sleep like three hours and start the whole thing over the next day. I mean, we, we did it all summer. It was unbelievable. So how, how hard was it to work with Bruce Pritchard? You know, I didn't have a lot of contact with Bruce back then. He was more in, in the office back then. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I didn't really interact with Bruce a lot back then. Well, I didn't know Bruce very well. For full disclosure, Jerry and I are good friends with Bruce, and we're Bruce's only friends. We're the only one only out Bruce. of 8 million people <laughs> that like Bruce. Me, we're the only two people on the planet that like Bruce. So, And we still haven't figured out why. We, we don't oh know why. God. He won't even return our call now that he's a big shot. I like Bruce. I mean, he, he uh, Bruce is, I he's a, a bad, funny he's guy. Younger. Yeah, he is. He is for sure. But you know, that whole, it was a great experience. Um, a lot of people felt that if you get that big of a buildup, you don't come through. It's kind of let the, the air out of the tires on the bus. You know, when you, when you win by DQ, a lot of people said uh, they want Taker 
and Vince's real plan, I was never, people think I was promised the belt and everything. Vince never promised me the world title. And he told me flat out, if I put the belt on you, that's the direction we go. I'd like to see that at WrestleMania 10 next spring. So Vince got Yoko and Taker in an angle. We did the DQ. And Vince said, if, if, if we can rev this thing back up for WrestleMania, if that's the direction we go. But Vince never promised me the title, never said, you're going to be my guy. People all say that and think that, but that was never the case behind the scenes with that whole thing. A lot of people thought maybe he should let me win in Detroit and SummerSlam and, then he, and beat me even a week later on, you know, on Raw or something, you know, for the title. And so I had the, as a baby face, kind of had the, the win after the big buildup. But other than that, Vince never made any promises with that thing, contrary to what a lot of people think. People ask me that all the time. Yeah, WrestleMania 10, I guess it was, where you wrestled Brett with a tie in the, the Royal Rumble, right? Where we tied, I wrestled Yoko uh, first. Uh, Kurt Henning was a ref, and it was like kind of a screw job. And I was going to wrestle Kurt after that, but then Kurt didn't sign, you know, Kurt. And, but uh, I got, uh, it was like a, another, uh, like a DQ win. So I got, uh, I got DQ'd or something. Oh, yeah, Kurt DQ'd me. So Brett ended up wrestling Yoko. And Brett, Brett was, uh, you know, at that time I heard the rumor he was threatening maybe retirement. And Vince was looking for that baby right. face. And Brett was very reliable at the time. Great, obviously a great worker uh, in the ring and was a great champion. And Vince went in that direction. So I never had, thought I got slighted or didn't, man, I was being featured in a, all these big pay-per-views. And I was in main event matches the whole time I was there. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I loved the opportunity to go back to WCW at the time for the Monday Night Wars. But I, I, I look finally back in my career with, even though maybe people think it was, it was not the big, that I was supposed to be the next Hulk Hogan. There was only going to be one Hulk Hogan. I never wanted to, or even thought there was going to be another Hulk Hogan. That's crazy. I sure. wanted to be the best Lex Luger I could be. And so people kind of put, kind of put that on me, but um, I enjoyed my time at WWE and I, uh, and, but I was also love getting back to WCW for the Monday Night Wars. That turned out to be a great move as well. The, the Lex, Lex, you you just you just said a lesson there for for a bunch of people, a bunch of young people that, that's in our business watching this podcast. Hopefully, that they picked up the same thing. You didn't want to be another uh, Hulk Hogan. You wanted to be the best Lex Luger that you could be. When these these guys now, I go yes, you know I'm out recruiting college. I, I want to be the next Brock Lesnar. I want to be this. I want the next Johnson. I know you don't. Though you could never be the next. You want to be the best, best guy that you can possibly yeah. be. You know? And Absolutely it's good to think true. it's good to think that way. But you just gave you just gave a little supplemental message there to everybody. Just be the best that you can be. Don't worry about how Hulk Hogan or The Rock or or any of these other guys. Be yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Lex, what, what, you were getting a, a good push in WWE, and you had a, a offer. You know, Sting, from what I hear from from Eric Bischoff, wanted to, you to come back to WCW. The Monday Night Wars were starting up. I don't think anybody dreamed that they would turn into what they they turned into. Uh, what was what was your thought process for leaving WWE and going back to WCW at that point? Because you had a pretty good gig at WWE. Yeah, they were sort of uh, putting the restart button with me. I was with the Allied Powers with Davey Boy, which I loved doing as a tag team. They were going to break Davey Boy up uh, as a tag team, him and I, and put us back as singles. Because Vince, you know, Vince prefers his top talent to be able to be tagged, but also carried as a single. So he was come up with storylines for Davey and I to split and singles. But at the time, my character was kind of in a transition phase. And um, I just put in my, you know, we signed those two-year deals. I just didn't renew. And Vince knew it. Vince and I were talking about my, where my character was going to go. I worked for, which I know is hard to believe, for six months without a contract at WWE. I, I planned on re-signing and wanted to. I, in casual conversation with Sting, because we've always been best of friends, mentioned that um, I was uh, somehow in our conversation that I was working at WG without a contract. He goes, Sting, like, like, hold, like, almost dropped his phone. Wait a second. You're not, you're wrestling in WWE the last six months and you're not under contract? I go, no, 
We're just working on a handshake. We're going to work out a new contract. I wanted to do some stuff on the side, like in fitness. And I wanted the language in there for the contract of Vince. We were kind of just working out the final details. Sting got on the phone with Eric. And Eric wasn't too big on me at the time. So he made me a low ball offer. I talked to Sting and said, we're doing this new Monday night show. I'm telling you, you come back and you and I can do some stuff together. And we're such good friends. I met in secret at Sting's house. Um, and Eric and I talked. And two weeks later, I was on house shows in Canada for Vince and Moncton, New Brunswick and all of them up there. And the next night I walked out on Nitro in the Mall of America. I, right off, I actually did take me out of the TV shows that I was in for, that I'd done with Vince the week before. I was on those shows. They had to pull me off those shows. And wow. so you thought by talking to Stings enough that you thought that the opportunity was so big that you were willing to take a low ball offer because you saw what the opportunity could be. Well, Eric heard I, I could be uh, not hard to work with, but I had a little bit of, I always said it was confidence, but a little bit of arrogance about me, which I did, I've been told. And Eric wasn't, <laughs> Eric wasn't too sure if I'd fit in with with, the, with kind of my reputation in the business. So he wanted to test me by lowballing. He goes, He'll, Eric's going to lowball you. Don't get insulted. I go, oh. and he goes, but you get in the door and you'll, 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 you'll get a good deal. So, and it worked out incredible. They kept, they kept me, I mean, they hit me at a different hotel across town in Minneapolis. They brought me in the back door of the mall with a, with a towel over my head and, a, and, a, and like a sheet around me. So you couldn't see my body. And on the other end of the mall, they did, none of the boys knew until uh, other than Eric and Sting, I think Hogan might've known. But when I, they walked me to the gorilla, the gorilla position, we all call it. Even though gorilla wasn't there, we all call it the gorilla. And, <laughs> Nobody knew I was I was there. And I walked, I just walked out on the show at the end there. Who would have known? I mean, we didn't have an idea then that it was gonna turn into like a big Monday night war, but that was kind of a good a good to be had the opportunity to be one of the first shots fired on that competition war thing. I had no idea it was gonna get that big. And boy, the rest was was man, you talk about his, a historic time in the business to be able to be a part of that. Wow. Yeah, it, there's been never been anything like it where you have two competing. Uh, opposite shows at the same exact time live. I mean, it's Man. like two football leagues or two. I mean, the ratings were astronomical. We're both oh. doing fours at the same time. Fours. I, yeah. I mean, just insane. That whole attitude era, all that. Just the cut. It was. It was the, the economy was good. People had that spendable. Thing. It was everything. All the stars aligned for that in the late nineties. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, incredible perhaps. thing to be a part of. Perhaps it was probably the greatest time in professional wrestling history, and I, and I, you guys both know, I've, I've been around since the mid uh, '50s in wrestling, and uh, 1960. Gerald was at 18. 18 50. 50. Well, yeah, I'm not Bruce Prichard. I was with uh, George Hackett Smith and and, uh, <laughs> and, and and Mr. Gotts here, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've been around since the '60s, and I've seen you know the big houses. And of course, I was right, right, right in front of, uh, right behind uh, when O'Connor and all the guys were drawing those Comiskey Parks and those Wrigley Field and those those big arena uh, shows like that. But uh, two organizations uh, that that were going there. I mean, it it was great to be a part of, and we all all three of us got to take great pride in probably being a part of perhaps the greatest time in, in our business history. Yeah, people ask me highlights of my career, obviously being a horseman, my slam Yokozuna, but man, that that whole Monday night, being a part of that, a cog in the wheel, man, that was that was a, 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 one of the real highlights of my career, for sure, for fi I've wrestled 15 years. That was definitely one of the top three, for sure. Lex, uh, you know, you mentioned Yokozuna there. Uh, they're tripping. That had to be a thrill for you. I remember when 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 that concept was was you know we were it was brought up and you could, I you know I, I was old school. I Tampa, Florida, old school, Oklahoma, and all of a sudden you know, we're going to do this on the Intrepid. Well, okay, Intrepid battleship, you know, uh, a carrier. Or, or how are we going to do this thing? And Vince's, Vince's vision of it was exactly how it took place. And, uh, but, the, you know, you, you were the, the wheel behind that thing there. That had to be a thrill for you. And this the whole setup of it. And you're going out, walking out there. I remember the pop when we when, when walked out there. It was unbelievable. Well, I was a heel at the time. I came down, pushed my manager, Bobby Heenan, 
out of the way and got in the ring with the red, white, and blue outfit and cowboy boots, which were very slippery on the bottoms, by the way. They wanted me uh -huh. to wear cowboy boots. I tell people, I was so scared when I got in that ring, the, the Manhattan skyline, the USS Chapel. Yeah. I go, I'm going to try to pick Yokozuna up in these slippery cowboy boots. I'm going to be like, I'm going to be like a squash, like a bug. I'm going to fall on my, on my uh, backside. <laughs> He's going to squash me trying to slam him. So I got nose to nose with Yoko in the ring. Oh, Yoko, I can't do it. I got, I got no, my boots, I got no traction. No, you, Yoko, he was a cool island boy. He goes, no problem, brother. Just get a wide base. Yoko, <laughs> you know how agile he was. I call, we called him the dancing bear. He literally, I can't take what you're, people talk about, you slammed him. He almost slammed himself that day. So I had wow. no footing. And people go, and the, some of the, some of the fans like that, we're watching your kids. You mean you knew you were going to slam them ahead of time? I go, man, I hate to spoil it for you, but yeah, it was pre-planned. They're like, <laughs> oh, but you acted so excited. I go, no, I was so relieved that I was able to, <laughs> that Yoko almost slammed himself with those cowboy boots on. Funny how you fixated something. I was begging you, Yoko, I can't do it. I can't do it. Yoko was great. What a great guy to work with, too. One of the best yeah. big men ever, I think. When Yoko came out in the building, uh, Jerry, you were then. I mean, yeah. the, the crowd, he, we called him the showstopper. I mean, when he came down that aisle, that music, he, he, man, he was something else. Yeah, there are moments, there's moments you never forget, and there are moments that just live with you forever. And, and that's truly a moment that, that I'll never forget in, in my long career. Yeah. Yeah, it was great, a wonderful moment. I was, I was, that, that was only something like you said, a, a guy, a visionary like Vince would dream up, but man, that was, that was live. One take, you can't, we weren't gonna be able to redo it. Yeah, so one that, take. <laughs> and we, we practiced the week before uh, over in Stanford and they didn't let me slam Yoko so they didn't want me to get hurt. I'm looking at Yoko, <laughs> we, weighed him on a, we weighed Yoko on a trucking scale in Germany, not long before that, 627 pounds. Wow. So I'm thinking, wait a second, you don't want me to slam him and practice? To see if we can really do it because you, they didn't want Yoko to get hurt. I mean, what about me? My gosh, I'm gonna have, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have like a, a double hernia here. What do you People mean? People don't realize, you know, I, I used to wear cowboy boots all the time and different stuff, you know, around the ring. It's so slippery, and if you get the wrong surface, yeah. On the mat oh, cover, it's, man, you're like on, you're like on ice skates or roller skates. Yeah, you got, and when you got one take, you know, I used to take a, a key and I would scratch the bottom of my cowboy boots just to give me some traction. You know, I wasn't but, smart enough to do that. I'm not from Texas. <laughs> I'm a New York boy. Thank goodness. <laughs> what do you mean, thank goodness, Jerry? <laughs> but, you know, people don't realize, you know, Hollywood will go spend, you know, a month getting ready for a stunt. We I, just can't kinda... believe I'm, I can't believe I'm sitting here with uh, Lex with somebody that helped kill a uh, supporter of a team that helped kill college football, the University of Texas Longhorns. Uh, don't <laughs> make that support. They, yeah, they right. <laughs> we bolted for big money and took Oklahoma <laughs> University with us and left Oklahoma State to go to the WAC or whatever. <laughs> Jerry, 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 Jerry's, Jerry's very bad about this, Lex, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> oh, yeah, Oklahoma, Texas. I get it. I get it. Runs yeah. deep. You still Le want Lex, 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 Lex. I mean, I, you know, I, this is a story that you probably had to tell a, a thousand times, and John and I have uh, been discussing it. Just, you know, it's almost something, you know, you, know, you don't look want to bring up but you know i man i'm i'm so interested in it and and i got i got to hear your your version of it the 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 brody story and 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 a cage match oh, yeah, never, that's one of, you you had never seen a cage match or even know didn't probably even know what a cage match was at that point in your career and you i'm sure you weren't very well coached on what to do in a cage match so just tell that's us that's nice way, but totally totally clueless <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm at, it was a long day. We did a TV in Tampa. We did our TVs. I drove across the Lauderdale and they put up a cage. I'm like, cage match? What do I do? And Lauderdale, you couldn't talk before the match. Right. They had the You're cage on both there, sides. The yeah, that, you, yeah. couldn't, you couldn't talk. So here I am close. And I heard all this stuff about Bruiser Brody. You know, like, he's, he's you know, and I, I didn't know Frank. I only saw Bruiser Brody in there. And it was something about the long day and the trip 
from Tampa and then we drive across to, to Lauderdale. I got in the cage. I didn't have a, I didn't have a blade on me. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was trying to run him into the cage the first minute of the match. I had no clue what I was doing. And he just was like, stop working. Like this ain't going to work. And I didn't know what he was doing. And, um, he's, I, I tried to like, you know, he's trying in to other say, words, you wasn't in the ring with no Ric Flair that could take you 60 minutes. <laughs> no, he just, about two minutes in the match or three minutes, just stopped working. I'd punch him. He wouldn't sell it. He'd do that little thing he did, that little sound, shake his head. And he, now he was a big, scary guy looking guy. Right. And so um, Fonzie, Fonzie was the referee, thankfully. And I go, Fonzie, what's going on? I, I'd only been working a number of months. I go, what do we do? He, he, what, what's wrong with him? Fonzie's like, I don't know, brother. I, I don't know what he's doing. So I go, what do we do? Fonzie, Fonzie told me, back him into the corner, start punching him. I'll grab your arm, swing me back when I grab your arm when you're punching him, and I'll DQ you. Because we, di we didn't know what to do. He just, he just stopped working. And, uh, and then here he is with his fingers all taped up with razor blades. And then, of course, the ring guy couldn't get the door unlocked. Okay. At this point, I was like a scared jackrabbit. I, I leapt up on the cage and jumped around. I didn't know what he was going to do. Brody, I mean, uh, I didn't know whether he was going to cut me with the razor blades. I was, I was legitimately scared of what was going on. I thought he was like having a mental incident or maybe he was, maybe he was on something. I, I was legitimately, I mean, I got a wife and a new baby at home. I'm getting out of this cage. And I and think I, you're right. I jumped probably over on the both cage of those to get out of there. <laughs> I walked over after the match because I said, man, Matsuda, if I don't walk over there and ask what I did wrong and apologize for whatever I did, I walked over there and Engelbert Humperdinck was in the room with them. I kind of knocked on the door. I go, well, if I'm going to get my butt whooped, I'm going to walk over there, at least go over there and find out what happened. Because my student, you know, taught me that way. I walked over, knocked the door, and Humperdinck said, I'm sorry, sir, but I don't know what happened there. I, I'd never been in a cage before. And now I'm talking to Frank, not Bruiser Brody. He goes, don't worry about it, brother. I'm in Texas right now. They're switching me, baby. He goes, you're going to, at the time, I'd already been on TV, like, that I was going to be going to, like, maybe be a horseman. You're going heel up, up in uh, Atlanta. He goes, we're in a cage. You've never done it before. He goes, it's been a long day. He goes, don't worry about it. He was real nice. Wow. He just, this wasn't so, working. There was, like, never was any, there was never any post And what was I relieved, too? <laughs> there, there was never any heat with you guys afterward or anything like that, See, right? Now, zero, but... They wanted me to be in a cage in the following week in Lakeland, and I and I bowed out. <laughs> well, I don't blame they, you. What got me did about that was you, you had worked with Brody before, right? Right, in a and, regular match. And then when you get in the ring, I, I'd heard all this stuff about Brody and Lex. You know, this is several years ago that it was a shoot and all this stuff. It wasn't a shoot. Brody just Brody just quit working. I, I'd never seen anything like it. He just stood there. You know, he, we had worked regular matches down in Florida. You know, do the loop. And we were fine. We, I mean, he worked snug, and I came from football. John, you know, that is, I, I liked working snug. We had no problem. He just stopped working that match. And then, of course, the following week, I'm getting ready to go to Atlanta with the horseman thing. And I, I told Matt Suda, who I loved, I said, you do the one more cage match in Lakeland. I go, hero. I go, I don't know what's going on with him, going on with, with, with Bruiser. But I go, I'll, co I'll come to the show. It worked out a thing where I got beat up and jumped on the way to the ring and another guy rushed in the cage. But I go, I, I, don't, I don't really, I'm not comfortable getting in the cage with him, to be honest with you. After 20 something years of retrospect, have you figured out any reason for him to just quit working? Because it wasn't, like, it wasn't like he quit working and went after you. He just quit working. He just stood there. Yeah, I thought he was anything like that. No, I, to this day, uh, I, I wish I could. I wish he was still here. Uh, I mean, he's not with us anymore. I'd love to find out what he was thinking. So I, I never knew. I never found out. But you're right about one thing. Those, those were such brutal days when we do TV on Wednesday morning, John. We'd have Tuesday night Tampa, and of course, the Tuesday night you're in Tampa, you'd want to go out and have a have a beer or be a little sociable. So 
sometimes at two or three o'clock in the morning before you get in bed. And then, then you're up at seven o'clock and your TV at eight 30 in the morning here in Florida. And it's brutally hot in that old sportatorium that we had down there. You right. do a couple hours of TV taping. You all burn out already. You know, the bears out of you sweated the bear out of you. Now you got to get in the damn car and drive across the state of Florida for about six hours. Yeah, through damn, the I'm Everglades, across the Miami And drive through the Everglades and Alligator yep. Alley and all that crap. And then, then fight the traffic once you get near Miami and Lauderdale. Then you got to go and get ready to, to to do it all over again, man. Those were brutal days. And, and tempers, are, tempers weren't always calm when you got to got to the building down there because everybody was right. better because the wedge was also payday for for the for the loop right. too so it, it had been a long so brody, day, brody, brody probably got uh, stiffed on his payoff and took it out on you you know john my only guess would be that that's a good question what was he thinking i think he was just like partly what he told me this why would they book me with this kid who's never been in a cage before He's clueless how to have a cage match. And that I'm Bruiser Brody who's had hundreds of cage yeah. matches. Why would they put this together on a long day? We just did TV. I think he was just basically like disgusted. Like he just stopped working. Right. You know, I, I mean, that would be my guess. Like, what am I doing to cage with this guy? This is ridiculous. He's just kind of like, I'm done for the day. You, you talked to him afterwards and there wasn't heat with you. No, none. Zero. <laughs> what a crazy, yeah, he was what a crazy cool. event. Yeah. Did did you have during during that time after you went back and you were kind of the first shot fired in the Monday Night Wars? I didn't know who was going to win. I was with WWE with Jerry and, and right. You know, right. I, I, we didn't know. I, people can say that that they knew. Maybe they did. Maybe they had inclination. I did not. I, I thought Vince McMahon would probably fi- would hopefully figure out a way. Did during that time, who did you think would win, Vince? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I've told many people this. I went to this big event for the opening of the old Braves Stadium at the time. It was opening like 97, and the Braves were going to play over. They, they did me as kind of a, a, uh, a uh, talking, like, like they had all the big executives come in for TBS, TNT, all the big advertisers. And they had this ice sculptures and shrimp and lobster. They had it overlooking the, the brave stadium it hadn't opened yet but it was almost ready to open it was quite the setting I mean, i was in all in there with all these suit and tie guys i was kind of just like a, a something for them to look at you know and they laid out the kind of the vision for tbs and tnt because aol time warner had come in on the business merger there and there we were kind of like their black sheep that pro wrestling but we got really good ratings and uh, the top guys and the, and the top of CNN Tower with the big windows and the big plant, big desks, were all there laying it out. They talked about where they were going with TNT, and where they wanted to go with TBS, and they're talking to the big advertisers, Coca Cola and all them. They laid out all uh, Hill Street Blues and all these programs they're going to put on and what they're going to do with the vision of the networks. They didn't mention one word about wrestling. I went home to my wife that night. I go, Peg? She goes, yeah. I go, I don't think Turner, I, you know, Ted was always the guy, but now it's AOL Time Warner. I go, I don't think they have any uh, desire. I go, if our ratings ever drop, I go, we're gone. They have no desire to carry wrestling on their program. That is not in their plan. Uh, I go, that, I was a conversation piece of that event. And I go, they are not going to keep wrestling. So I knew when push came to shove and it really went ahead, that just my personal feeling, that 97 event I was at, I was privy to, they showed their hand, AOL Time Warner, they had no interest in, in keeping wrestling. They ended up basically giving it away, right? Instead of fighting back and continue war, they like just sold all their content like a fire sale and gave it to Vince when Vince surged ahead. So, right. So really that glimpse I got back in 97, uh, the guys in the, in the, in the, in the towers uh, way above the, just the WCW brand that they had there, I, I, I was convinced they were looking for a way to dump it first chance they got. 
Yeah, it was that uh, huge AOL merger that, you know, ended up being horribly overpaid merger, and that pretty much killed the uh, WCW at the same time. Well, well, Ted used to always come, uh, like, come see us at some of the television tape and said, you, you guys are my wrestlers, he'd call us. And he goes, as long as I'm here, you're here. But at that point, he finally did not have the final say-so. He was not a majority shareholder anymore. He was he was still involved, but his role was actually, he founded it all, but he was more minor at that point. John, you know, you're a business guy. I watch you on Fox Business stuff all the time. You know how that works, right? Well, once once he wasn't majority shareholder anymore, he had he had uh, he had no he had no say so over the wrestling, and they they were looking to get rid of it. And I'm I'm convinced from back in '97 they're looking for the first because our ratings were so high they couldn't get rid of us. We were kind of low cost production and high ratings. But once it dipped, they were looking to unload it for sure. So that's why I think I was convinced Vince was going to end up winning because Vince, it's his life, it's his passion. He's gonna, he's going to stay with it. And, right. and with the wrestling and and we did not have that commitment from AOL Time Warner yeah one thing that I didn't realize until I saw some of your interviews was what good friends you were with Harley Race you're talking about people you know being like Harley Race was let go at one point and you went to bat for him which I, I thought was pretty cool but I didn't realize that you you know you had Harley you had Bobby Heaney he is the greatest managers of all time I didn't realize you're such good friends with Harley Race and actually rode with him for a while I did and you know uh uh, they, I think they figured I needed a lot of help. I had the body, but I needed a lot of help in the ring. So I was never known for my work. And I, I, I had a good look, but I wasn't known for my work, working ability in the ring. And so they always like put Harley or somebody with me. And yeah, Harley race, everybody knows the stories, but it, it was, I heard, but I, until I experienced it, I, I, I always liked the drive, right? But when you got in the car with Harley, Harley was driving and he did. He had the cigarette in one hand <laughs> he had a beer in the other, and he had that cigarette hand on the steering wheel. And Harley, we'd out, we always got that uh, that Avis Cadillac, and Harley would bury down, uh, bury that speedometer like 110, wherever it would go to. Harley and and like I mean, unbelievable. He he was a road warrior, and and uh, yeah, Harley was the real deal, and uh, he was what a, what an honor. And a pleasure to be around him and and learn from him and the he he was a he was a special guy probably the most legendary wheel man in the history oh. of the business. My, I thought I was a pretty good wheel man, but Harley was the man. He was the <laughs> all time wheel man, no doubt about it. Hey Gerald, I think you're on mute. <laughs> well, I guess it's just you and me now, John. It's just us. We lost Jerry, which is the best part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> He's from uh, Oklahoma. You know, they, they, I had to send him all kinds of like a, the, the, the tomato can and the string between yeah, Texas exactly. and Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to put up with this crap, you know. Ah, there he is. <laughs> you He's think bad. I can't hear you, Layfield, but I can hear him. You know, hey, Lay, I'll tell you. Jerry, 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 that's how Jerry, Lex, that's that? how these Texans are. You, you've been friends with a Texan. You always got to keep your eyes on them. I mean, if you never, if you go off one second, you know why that dumb Okie, you know, from south north of the Red River. Uh, yeah, hey, you got to be say, careful. I spent the, this past weekend in Texas, and Texas people are very friendly. I, I, I like Oklahoma folks too, but man, they are the friendliest people. I'm telling you. When, Ron and I were in the we're that sounds like a man. country and western song. <laughs> I'm telling you, nice people down there. Lex, I got the opportunity as an honor to interview Sting one time for the WWE Network, and he kind of like you did went went through some uh, some rough times, which a lot of people didn't know mm -hmm. about. You know, and then that's a nice way of putting it, John. <laughs> some bad, some real bad, some real bad choices with with drugs, alcohol, women. Yeah, it definitely had a cascading. Uh, downward spiral for me, even though I would never would have admitted, I always thought I had control of it and had a handle on it. I can stop anytime I want. I used to stop sometimes to show everybody I could do it until, until I couldn't. And my life completely uh, came apart. Uh, right after I, my contract uh, was extended for like a guarantee for two more years when Vince bought us out, 
I had way too much money and way too much time on my hands. And I, I was making a really, a lot of bad decisions in my life. Uh, we all know the tragic passing of Elizabeth, who was uh, my girlfriend at the time. And people thought that might be my wake up call. It wasn't. Um, I'm a miracle to be sitting in front of you guys. I know I'm taking a serious turn here to still be alive and talking to you guys. Uh, if it wasn't for people that God put in my life. And uh, I try to give back to that now, John's things the same way. Um, I, uh, I went to a, I was in jail uh, on drug charges and I met a, uh, this chaplain guy kept on trying to talk to me. I was basically like an agnostic atheist guy, didn't grow up in church. And he took me to a church service when I got out. He, he tracked me down and wanted me to work him out. I thought I'd run out of gym. I couldn't get rid of this chaplain guy. I thought I'd like, make him so sore doing lunges and squats. And we ended up hanging together. He invited me to a Sunday night church service one, Dr. Frady, ended up becoming my earthly spiritual dad, did a message on, are you standing on the rock or the sand? And I realized that man, our careers change, our finances change, people change in our lives. And, and there's really my whole life you know, based on shifting sand. That was the message. Or are you going to base your life on the eternal rock, meaning Jesus? And a week later in a hotel room, I got, I committed my life to Christ and my whole life transformed. I realized there's a much bigger purpose in life than just ourselves. Uh, we're here to serve others. It used to be myself and I, and I realized now it was, it was uh, Jesus, others, and then you, the joy formula, J-O-Y. And it just gave me a whole new, bigger purpose of why I'm here in my life. And Sting had gone through it in 98, and I thought I'd, I'd lost my best friend. Him and I had our only real friendship separation because I thought, man, Jesus has become like a Jesus freak. I was mad at him because he didn't want to go drinking with me anymore and womanizing and partying. And, uh, and from 98 to 06, there was a real fracture in our friendship. And then uh, I got saved and we were re uh, God reunited us. And uh, I, I tell people, God takes our, our worst decisions we make in terms of the positive. Now we talked about earlier about mentoring people. And, and now I, I do recovery coaching and to help people that are going through the same struggles I had, letting know there's, there's light on the other side. And I love doing that. And I just know God will take our worst things and comfort us and bring us through it. And now, now he wants us to do that with others. So I know, John, you do, we talked earlier, you do a lot of stuff with, with young boys, the rugby. And Jerry, you've mentored so many guys uh, at WWE for decades. And that's what it's really about is, is, is mentoring. And, and I have accountability people in my life now I never had. Uh, just I could go on and on. But, but that, that uh, April 23rd of 06 was, was – uh, the, my transformational moment for eternity and I'm so thankful and he God brought me through a spinal cord injury where I had a one percent chance of ever standing or walking again I can stand again and walk I'm not the same guy I lost 100 pounds of muscle from my neurological injury up in my cervical area but I'm so thankful what I can do and you know I also God surrounded me so many strong uh, people in my life let me know don't focus on what you can't do Lex focus on what you can do so um, I'm so thankful for I know I said a lot there John but no, no, I, Jerry, but wow. it's uh, it's it's I, I love each day I, I, I know is a gift now and I just wake up with that attitude of gratitude and uh, I haven't touched a drug or a sip of alcohol in over a decade and I'm, I'm so thankful for the people God's placed in my life and what he's done in my life uh, it's it's I tell people it's experiential. I can't describe uh, a lot of people. Uh, you can't describe it. It's only something you can experience. So you, you, you said a lot, but that's the most important thing you can say also. And, and it's an incredible story and an incredible inspiration. When Sting uh, got the honor of interviewing Sting, he told me some, he really said it in a unique way. He said, I didn't go through a 10 step program. I went through a one step program. And there's so many guys who've gone through, you know, rehab and, and eventually sometimes they make it, but usually they don't make it the first time. But your whole reason for getting it was a, a religious reason because of taking Jesus into your life, not because of rehab. Did you try rehab also during that time? 
I went through a lot of rehabs. You learn a lot of good stuff there. They're, they're effective for the short term. But I, man, I kept on going back to my old lifestyle until, until I had the, the conviction of God living inside me, really, and not wanting to put that in my body anymore. And knowing that that's the Holy Temple or the Holy Spirit, I didn't want to pollute that, that my body's a gift you know, mental, physical, spiritual, I, that, that gave me the conviction and the desire to, to walk away. I was always on that roller coaster, drugs and alcohol. And really the, for me personally, not, and a lot of people do the AA and all that stuff and it's good stuff and it's worked for a lot of people. I get it. But for me, it was, it was like, thing was the one step program for sure. Absolutely. And have you now worked with a lot of former uh, of the boys, the girls, the, the guys who are in the business? Is have a lot of them reached out to you as they've done to you know a lot of you know we, we came through an era of drugs, you know the we did. 80s and, and the work the hard, 90s. the work hard, play hard era, right, John? Right. That's right. Yeah. And, and right. you really know how bad they were. You know, I, I don't yeah. think anybody knew really in in the eighties how bad steroids could be for you, how bad pain pills could be for you. And, you know that now, right. but in hindsight, we didn't. Now, now they just get addicted to the gaming and stuff, right? It's great. Most of the guys. Right. That's right. Yeah. 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 A yeah. lot healthier. A lot healthier for their bodies, for sure. But part of part of part of what you're doing also is also with some of the old guys and, and girls in the, in the wrestling business, right? That reach out. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm here to encourage them any way I can. If they, you got to want help. I mean, if you want, if you want to, you got to want to get help. And any of the guys that they know, I'm always there available to reach out. I'm one, I'm one of many guys, but I've definitely tried to encourage guys and, and, and help them any way I can. So yeah, I, I enjoy doing that for sure. And I, I work with a, a group called Team Challenge. They, uh, they work with people that have addiction issues and I come and speak with their, their groups of men. It's a one and a half year program they put guys on. So I really enjoy doing that. How is your health now? After the, the, I heard it was a spinal stroke. Then I saw that you said it really wasn't. It was some type of spinal cord injury on a, on a flight. Right. Like but how is your health now? Man, I, I mean, I don't look the same, but really, looks can be seen by tell people, I'm the healthiest I have ever been. Talk about a miracle of God. My checkups, my doctors, other than your mobility issues you have, neurologically for your injury, go, my health and my blood work and my checkups and my blood pressure everything they go they tell me you're one of the healthiest i just turned 63 guys i've ever had in my office i'm on no medications zippo i mean i am i am ridiculously healthy now people look at me and go wow look at lax wow he's so skinny and you know all that i said i've been streamlined and redefined <laughs> I go, well, but health wise i mean i'm i'm the healthiest i've ever been in my adult life to be honest with you, which is just i'm so thankful for that and that's that's really a miracle as well do you have Lex, to Lex, you have such a positive attitude after all your health issues that you went through and all, all the tragedies, starting with Miss Elizabeth and, and all that. To you, but you fall back like a true athlete. It, it's got to give you some satisfaction, though, when, when you can look at yourself in the mirror when you get up in the morning. I feel good about myself. And I, I follow you on social media. You're one of the most positive guys out there. And that that helps so much. I mean, you, when 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 they see a guy like you with all 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 the heartbreak that you go through, be so positive out there. It sends a message to these young young people, that men and women out there, that hey, no matter how bad it is, if you have a great attitude towards life, you come back with it. I mean, I know you guys can vouch for as well. Really, in life, it's not what happens to you; it's how you respond to it. Adversity, right? I mean, my one mentor always told me, Lex, it's not the wind direction of the wind, it's the set of the sail. That's the only thing you can control in life. The wind can blow in any direction, but you, you, you could, if you can control the set of the sail and how you respond to both the good times or the adversity is really the key. So um, the, for me, that's been, uh, I tell people, young people, if there's one characteristic, because you can have good times and bad times in life, but that perseverance meant just keep on persevering, don't, the old Winston Churchill quote, right? Don't never, never, never quit. Just keep on keeping on, man. I tell people that's, if I could, could put a, my finger on a characteristic that I see in, in people in life that get through tough times and even through them, is that, that spirit of perseverance. And 
a lot of times we could do that from, from guys like you and us where we, we encourage people when they're ha going through tough times. Other people have been there for me and now I want to be there for others. But man, just perseverance, man. That's what if there's a one quality I admire in people is perseverance for sure. And the ability to know that an incident in your past doesn't define you. You know, absolutely. Your definition is written every day. Yep. You know? each, yep. Each day we get a clean slate. So don't hang on to the old, the old, you know, stuff. Is it, are you going to use the stuff in the past that I, my mentors teach me as a bridge or a burden? Are you going to become bitter or better? And I, I choose to be better and use it as a bridge and then use my, like we talked about earlier, some of the worst times I went through now, I can help other people with that. Now that, now that I've been brought to, you know, cross that bridge and come out the other side, a better person. So, which I'm very thankful for. Well, Lex, I'm with Jerry. I was watching all, all your interviews getting ready for this, and you're, you've, you're one of the most positive people I know. It, it, I don't know you that well. I've only met you, but it's, it's really inspirational to see that and to see your message of what you're doing now, of positivity, your, your life dedicated to Jesus, to helping others. It's really a cool story. And when, when Jerry said we had a chance to get you on, I said, this is awesome, because I was also a big fan of Lex Luger, the total package, uh, the four well, horse, thank you, John. the world champion. It's a real honor to have you on the show. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Thank you, John. I get up every morning, man. Thank God for the breath of my lungs and the beat of my heart, man. I, I love it. So Ooh. I'm just going to keep on trying to put, put a, a good positive vibe out there for others, for sure. Lex, I really appreciate you coming on, and and I uh, and I hope you forgive me for my comment I made on there. But, you know, <laughs> I love it. I got. I, 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 I apologize. I'm, 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 I'm apologizing, to, and and I'm, no, I'm so I, glad you came. Jerry, I'm, I'm you so glad. I, I was shooting. It. I was shooting. Yeah, but I. I but I don't, I don't do shoot interviews. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but Lex, well, thanks I, I, so I much, so man. Hard. You, thanks, you thanks, have, guys. you have had. Uh, such a, a marvelous career and wow i mean the experiences and and you know people i and i have been in a business for so long i'm shocked too because people just don't realize you were just taken out of training school and put in a main event spot just about and expected to compete with all these world-class athletes on a world-class level that you hadn't even had time to be on a local level at that time. Yeah. And you Lucas. know, that, that mental toughness that you have, you develop as an athlete and now as a person, as a man brought you through all that, just like it did all your hardships there and your belief and your faith and everything. And I've gained so much respect for you just, just in the last few months to tell you the truth uh, and, and, and watching you on social media and how you developed your, your brand as the kids call it nowadays and you're a positive man and I, i'm proud to, proud to have you on there proud to proud to say i i know you and, and can become a friend of yours thank you jerry and john thanks for so, so much for having me on guys a lot of fun a lot of fun mm -hmm.